Well, welcome to summer. Today we are beginning a new sermon series uh, called Pain and Resilience. I want to thank Donovan for uh, bringing the last message on the wisdom series last week uh, from the book of Proverbs. But today we're turning the page and starting a series called Pain and Resilience. Let me begin this morning uh, by asking you a question. What is the most difficult situation that you have ever had to make it through in your life? Was it an illness? Was it a divorce? Was it a financial situation, loss of a job? Was it the loss of a spouse or a family member? Was it a situation of infidelity? Was it a a deep depression or addiction of some sort? Was it the betrayal of a friend that you had counted on and uh, who turned on you or did you wrong? When you look back over your life, however old or young you might be, what is the most difficult situation that you've ever had to make it through? I believe that as human beings, there are a number of universal truths that apply uh, to all of us. And uh, the list is actually pretty long, but I'm going to name five things that I think uh, every single one of us would agree with uh, as a human being. The first is this. We all want to be loved, appreciated, and respected. Second, we all search for meaning and purpose in our lives, and we want our lives to matter. We want to make a difference. We want to be significant. Third, We all seek to form and sustain meaningful relationships with other people because we are, by our very nature, social creatures. Fourth, we want to experience happiness, however we understand or define happiness. Fifth, we all have to deal with pain and disappointment no matter who we are. It's universal. It's real. Now, some people have to deal with more pain and more disappointment than than others, but as humans, this is something that is unavoidable. It is a, a given. Nobody gets a pass on it. We all experience pain and heartache and disappointment in our lives. Now, as I look back over my own life, just like you were doing a few moments ago, there are definitely certain times that I can remember Uh, having to go through pain and heartache and disappointment, perhaps at the top of that list, as many of you have heard me say before, was losing my mother 13 years ago uh, to a suicide. Never in a a million years would I have guessed that that's how her life uh, would come to uh, an end. Uh, And that experience gave me a lot of empathy and compassion for suicide survivors and for those who have depression and mental illness in their families. But at that point, I had a decision to make. Um, I was three years out of, three years, I was three months out of seminary. um, And I had a decision to make. I could get angry with God and I could say, is this my reward for going to seminary, for answering the call, for giving my life, committing my life to serve the church and to follow you. I could get angry. I could leave the church. I could give up on faith. I could walk away from, uh, from, from the church and go to something else. Or I could realize that God doesn't cause the bad things that happen in life. Even though people will walk up to you and say things like, oh, it was just a part of God's plan, which by the way is not helpful. Or God needed your mother in heaven, also not helpful. God doesn't cause tragedy. When terrible things happen, God's heart breaks with us. God cries with us. God suffers with us. You know, as Christians, though, we worship a God who came to earth in human form, who suffered and was crucified on a cross. God relates to us in our pain in the deepest of ways through Jesus Christ. And thankfully, at that point in my life, I chose the second approach. And in 13 years of ordained ministry, I have had the opportunity on many occasions to help other people who have been through similar situations, and I know their pain, and I know their hurt, and I know their guilt, and I know their anger, and I can resonate with them because of what I had to go through. 
I want to state the obvious this morning. The pain of life is real. The pain of loss is real. The pain of fear is real. The pain of death is real. Sometimes things happen in life that shake us to our core and that leave us feeling like we can't go on. And for some reason, there are certain people that seem to experience way more than their fair share of trials and tribulations and, and, and suffering and heartache. And we can't explain why that is. And as human beings, we never get a satisfactory answer to that question that Philip Yancey calls the question that never goes away, the question of why, at least not on this side of death. We come up with theories, but they're all inadequate. The question of theodicy has stumped theologians and ministers for centuries. Why do bad things have to happen to us if God is all-powerful and all-loving? There's a book that I have recommended to many of you over the years. It's a very special book, and it's helped me in my own life grow through pain and grief and loss. But it's written by a guy named Jerry Sitzer, who was a uh, uh, he is a professor at Whitworth University, used to be called Whitworth College. And uh, many years ago, Sitzer lost his four-year-old daughter, his wife, and his mother in a car accident that he and his other children survived. So just like that, three generations of women and his family were taken away. And so he's writing this book out of the pain of that experience. So in the book, he, he talks about the soul. He says the soul is elastic. It's like a balloon. It can grow larger through suffering. Loss can enlarge its capacity for anger, depression, despair, and anguish, which are all natural and legitimate emotions whenever we experience loss. But once enlarged, the soul is also capable of experiencing greater joy and strength and peace and love. He says those who suffer loss live suspended between a past for which they long and a future for which they hope. And catastrophic loss, by its very definition, uh, precludes recovery. It will transform us or destroy us, but it will never leave us the same. There is no going back to the past, which is gone forever, but only going ahead to the future, which is yet to be discovered. And this book by Sitzer is so profound because he basically uh, makes the case that we can grow through the most difficult situations in our life, we can expand our capacity to love more and to serve more and to hope more. And, and, to, and, and we, we build up resilience when we go through these types of situations. Now, of course, everybody deals with their own pain differently. Uh, some people, when they experience pain and hardship, they, they, they start drinking uh, too much. And, uh, and, and quickly that can get out of control. Some people start taking pills. Uh, I'm convinced that this opioid epidemic that's rampant in our country, and Tennessee is one of the top states for it, I, I think that it's simply people that just want an escape from their pain. And then what happens is they get addicted after they try it, and they have a hard time giving it up. But uh, people deal with their pain differently. Some people become workaholics, and they start working 80 hours a week. Some people start shopping and buying things that they can't afford simply because that makes them feel good. Everybody deals with their pain differently. There are healthy ways to deal with pain, and there are unhealthy ways uh, to deal with pain. But the reality remains we can't run from it. We have to face it. We have to confront it, and if we don't, it will rear its ugly head when we least expect it. Now, in the Bible, specifically in the letters of the Apostle Paul, there are some very powerful passages of Scripture that have given people, Christians, even non-Christians, hope for many, many generations. And I'm going to share a couple of those with you this morning. Mary Claire read two of them. First from Romans 5. Paul writes, We boast in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And then those words of Jesus in John's gospel when he says, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trials, you will have pain, you will have heartache, you will have loss, you will have grief, you will have suffering. But he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. There's a guy by the name of Rob Bell. Some of you might have heard of Rob Bell. He was a, a megachurch pastor up in Michigan years ago. And, um, and back around 2007, he wrote a book that got him into a little bit of trouble uh, with his evangelical church. And uh, so Rob Bell left uh, his church, but now he's got a pretty sweet gig. He lives in California. He travels around with Oprah, and he speaks everywhere. But uh, the book that he wrote is called Love Wins. And this is what he said in that book, part of it. He says, love demands freedom. It always has, and it always will. Love, by its very nature, is freedom. For there to be love, there has to be the option to not love to turn the other way, to reject the love extended, to say no. Although God is powerful and mighty when it comes to the human heart, God has to play by the same rules that we do. God has to respect our freedom to choose to the very end, even at the risk of the relationship itself. If at any point God overrides, co-ops, or hijacks the human heart, robbing us of our freedom to choose, then God has violated the fundamental essence of what love even is. You see, in life, you cannot have love without freedom and choice, and you cannot have love without the risk of loss and hurt. So we ask this question, why? Why do we have to go through the things that we do? Why do we have to experience pain? Why do we have to suffer? Why do we have to hurt? Why do we have to say goodbye to the people that we've loved for decades? And we have to acknowledge that these things are simply the result of being able to live and love freely. And love does not control. And love always brings risk. And nobody ever said that life is supposed to be easy and free of pain. Whoever said that was wrong. Life is not easy and free of pain. Bell makes the point that people choose to live in their own hells all the time. We do it every time we isolate ourselves, give the cold shoulder to someone who has slighted us, every time we hide knives in our words, every time we harden our hearts in defiance of what we know to be the loving, good, and right thing to do. He says, if we want isolation and despair and the right to be our own God, then God graciously grants us that option. If we insist on using our God-given power and strength to make the world into our own image, then God allows us that freedom. If we want nothing to do with the light and hope and love and grace and peace, then God respects that desire on our part, and we are given a life that's free from any of those things. If we want nothing to do with love, then we have the ability to make that choice. But I believe that we are here for a purpose. And I think that Jesus articulated that purpose when he was asked, what's the greatest teaching? He says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two things hang all the law and the prophets. Sounds simple, right? It's complicated. It always has been, but we know what the marching orders are. I think that God has given each and every one of us the ability to be resilient, the ability to bounce back when terrible things happen. Um, this is part of what I think the Easter message is all about, the spirit of resurrection that when things in life get us down, when we reach dead ends, when we get into circumstances that we didn't see coming or that we prayed wouldn't happen, that God gives us the strength to bounce back from it. And, 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 and I think that this, this word resilience is something we're gonna talk about this month, uh, but, but what is it? How would you describe it? What does it mean to be resilient? The American Psychological Association says this, resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress, 
such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, or workplace and financial stressors. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. Resilience is ordinary, not extraordinary. And it's, it's not a trait that people either have or don't have because it involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. Now, we were traveling back this week from the Outer Banks where we went on vacation, and, um, and we, we flew from uh, Norfolk to Atlanta and then Atlanta to Nashville. And we are traveling with, uh, with uh, the grandparents, with Roy and Ann, uh, so traveling with Roy is like having four kids in the airport, right, Ann? Um, and um, anyway, we're coming back, and I pick up a, a book in, in the uh, Atlanta airport. It's a Harvard Business Review. It's a blue book, and it's called uh, it's on emotional intelligence. And in that book, there was an article that was first written in 2002 by this lady named Diane Kotu. And in that article, she says, resilient people possess three defining characteristics. First... They accept the harsh realities that are facing them. They're realists. They don't sugarcoat it. Second, they're able to find meaning in terrible times. And third, they have an uncanny ability to improvise and make do with whatever is at hand. They are survivors. So the question is, if we all agree that we experience pain, if we all agree that, that we experience heartache and setback and disappointment, and if we can develop resilience in our lives, then how do we do it? Um, if it's the same thing as emotional intelligence, you've got your IQ, which is set at birth, and then you've got your EQ. Well, guess what? Your IQ is what it is, for better or worse. It's not going to move or change throughout your life. You can pretend that it's higher than it really is, but it is what it is. But your EQ is your emotional intelligence, and you have the ability to improve and work on that. The same thing is true with resilience. You might view yourself as somebody who's not a resilient person, but you can work on that. You can bounce back. So what are the things that we can do in our lives to become more resilient? I'm going to leave you with, with these seven ideas, and you can think about whether any of them would be helpful to you. And, and this is the theme we're going to stick with during June. The first thing you can do is you can make strong connections in your life. You can develop strong relationships with family members and friends and other people that are important to you. And then when you're going through a hard time, you can accept help from them because you can realize that there are times in all of our lives when we need help from other people. Uh, that's why we push small groups at Woodmont so much. Um, it's not because we want you to have something else to do. It's because we want you to have relationships with people that will be there for you when you go through a difficult time. Secondly, avoid seeing any crisis as an insurmountable problem. You can't change the fact that tragic and highly stressful events will happen, but you can change how you interpret and respond to those events. Um, try looking beyond the present uh, to future circumstances. It might become a little bit better. Don't give in to catastrophic thinking. Third, accept that change is simply a part of life, and the people that are most miserable in life are the people that fight every single change along the way. You know, there are things that are going to happen which will make certain goals or plans that you had before unachievable. <clears throat> and sometimes accepting change is difficult and we don't want to do it. But the sooner we accept the fact that change is a part of life, all of us change, our families change, our jobs change, our health changes, then we can learn to accept it and live with it rather than fighting it all the time. Fourth, always look for opportunities for personal growth in any situation. You know, when we're going through the most difficult situations, we have a chance to grow. There are many people who have experienced tragedies and hardship, and guess what? They came out of that stronger. They had stronger relationships. They had a greater source of inner strength. They had an increased sense of self-worth, a more developed spirituality, a heightened appreciation for life. And so always look for chances to grow. Fifth, always keep things in perspective. Even when you're facing painful events, try to consider the stressful situation in a broader context and keep a long-term perspective. Avoid blowing the event out of proportion. Try to count your blessings when you're going through a hard time. Keep things in perspective. Sixth, and I could do a series on this, maintain a hopeful and positive outlook. 
It's amazing the difference between people that go through hard times and they have a positive outlook or a negative outlook. Uh, if you want to go be around somebody who's positive all the time, go hang out with Rich Sanderson for a little while. And uh, he radiates positivity all the time. And, and it's much better to go through hard times when you're being positive than when you're being cynical and, and negative because that only makes the situation worse. And then the seventh uh, thought that I'll leave you with this morning is take care of yourself. And that's not selfish, by the way. Pay attention to your own needs and feelings. Engage in activities that, that nurture your soul. Do the things that, that give you meaning and fulfillment in life. Uh, uh, you know, exercise, sleep, eat, uh, eat better than I do. Uh, take care of yourself. And, and, and that'll, that'll keep your mind and your body primed to deal with situations that require resilience. And again, self-care has never and will never be selfish. David Moore served this church from 1980 to 1987. Uh, he followed Dr. Jawoda and Claire Berry when uh, Claire went to California. And um, many of you remember this, but in 1986, David's wife, Dana, had a long battle with cancer. Um, and she was very involved in this church in the Christian education Sunday school. But she, she lost that battle in, in, in March of 1986. And so David uh, pastored here for a little bit longer, and then he stepped down in 1987. And after that, he left uh, the country and went to Oxford University, I think, to heal. And he also uh, did some postdoctoral work, and he wrote a little book called The Liberating Power of Pain. And I think we have copies of it here at, at Aspire Books. But this is what he says in that book. He says, the Christian faith is founded on the suffering of a single person, Jesus of Nazareth. His constant pain brought on by rejection and misunderstanding, loneliness, and finally the crucifixion and resurrection vividly demonstrates the whole love of God. He says, the model that we have in Jesus is that while God does not cause or desire our suffering, that very suffering can be the means by which we are caught up in an ever deeper relationship with God and with other people. And David wrote that book and he wrote those words because he lived it and he experienced it. And he knew what it was like to grow and to be transformed through pain. Paul says we boast in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Resilience is something that we can develop. It's a gift from God, and it's something that can grow if we're open to working on it. And that will make us stronger no matter what it is that we experience in our lives. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, the following four individuals to come forward. Uh, as our new Stephen leader.